Today is June 6th, the 78th anniversary of the Allied landings at the beaches of Normandy. The Allies landed some 156,000 troops on D-Day, either on the beaches or via airborne operations. And many said throughout those landings, chaos reigned. Yet somehow the Allies still managed to gain their foothold on Fortress Europe. There are so many stories of heroism and massive Operation Overlord, among them the story of the little-known 1st Canadian Parachute Battalion. The Canadians are among the first allies to set foot in France on D-Day. It is history that deserves to be remembered. According to the Juneau Beach Centre, Canada's Second World War Museum and Cultural Centre located in Normandy, France, the idea for a Canadian parachute battalion was inspired by the successes of British and German paratrooper operations in the early stages of the Second World War. Initially, however, the idea was not for offensive operations overseas, but as a means of defending Canada's vast remote areas. And this was seen as necessary as the risk to having to defend Canadian soil from a foreign enemy became more realistic as tensions were rising in the Pacific and German U-boats were prowling eastern Canadian waters and even venturing up the St. Lawrence Seaway. The 1st Canadian Parachute Battalion was created by the Canadian military on July 1st, 1942. It was constituted along the lines of the British paratroops and so included battalion and company commands and three infantry regiments. All told, 26 officers and 590 men of all ranks. The center notes that recruiting for volunteers was at first difficult, as men were concerned that volunteering for the parachute battalion would limit them to home defense, which was, the center webpage notes, a prospect of little appeal for young men eager for action. Recruiting improved when the appeal was made to men who had already volunteered for foreign service, and the same appeal that was seen in the U.S. and U.K., the prestige of being part of an elite unit, drew sufficient volunteers. An April 2020 edition of the online news for Kirby Center Canada quotes Lou Lamy, who volunteered for the battalion at age 17. I read quite a bit about it and heard about it. It was exciting. I told them that was what I wanted to do. All members of the battalion were required to go active, that is, to volunteer to be eligible for foreign service. As Canada had established no infrastructure for training paratroops, the Canadian forces were trained in both the United States and the United Kingdom. The idea was to combine the best part of both training regiments for the Canadian program. The group sent to the UK trained at Number 1 Parachute Training School at RAF Ringway. In the United States, training was done at the United States Army Airborne School, commonly called Jump School, at Fort Benning, Georgia. The risks involved were illustrated when the unit's first commander, Major H.D. Proctor, was killed in a training accident on September 7, 1942. Most men of the battalion would be trained at Fort Benning, but in April 1943, Canada opened its own parachute training base at Canadian Forces Base Shiloh, near Manitoba. Lamy told Kirby News, We had to do five jumps out of the airplane to get our wings. I thought it was a lot of fun. Some of the Canadians trained at Fort Benning would become part of the 2nd Canadian Parachute Battalion, which would then be integrated into the 1st Special Service Force, a joint Canadian and American commando unit that became known as the Devil's Brigade. But the 1st Canadian Parachute Battalion was entirely composed of Canadians. Canada had a fully trained parachute battalion by March 1943. As the risk of home invasion had faded by then, it was decided to deploy the battalion overseas as part of the Canadian element in the United Kingdom. They would continue training at RAF Ringway, and while its officers were all Canadian, the battalion would serve as part of the British 3rd Paratroop Brigade, 6th Airborne Division. The unit would remain part of the Canadian Army, but be under British command. 31 officers and 548 men of the battalion shipped out for Britain in July 1943 on the Queen Elizabeth. Lamy said, Everything seemed to happen very fast. I wasn't nervous. I was training as hard as I could to get there. The battalion trained in England for another 10 months. They trained on special roles like operating machine guns and heavy mortars, as well as rigorous physical training. Finally, Lamy said, they told us that's enough training. It's time to go to work. The role of the 6th Airborne Division at Normandy was called Operation Tonga, guarding the eastern flank of the invasion force. Their task included capturing two important bridges over the Orne River and Con Canal, as well as assaulting the Merville Gun Battery, the subject of another episode of The History Guy. The 1st Canadian Parachute Battalion was selected to lead the landing. In fact, their first objective was to secure the drop zones for the rest of the division. The three companies were then tasked with various objectives, including destroying bridges that the Germans might use to move reinforcements. 
Company C was tasked with capturing the village of Veraville and destroying a bridge to the south that would be a likely route for German armor. Each with a 30 kilogram, nearly 70 pounds kit bag, in addition to a knife, French currency, and enough rations to last them 48 hours, the Canadians were transported aboard 50 Armstrong Whitworth Albemarle transports, jumping out of a hole in the floor the size of a bathtub. But despite all the training and planning, the jumps didn't go as planned. While they had been told the anti-aircraft would be light, in fact, the planes faced significant flak. Pilots attempting to avoid the flak, or having their planes simply pushed and jarred by it, broke from assigned flight trajectories. Paratroopers were thrown around, some injured inside the planes, and equipment became entangled. Pilots became lost or disoriented. Some drop zones were obscured by fog. Some men jumped early as they were anxious to exit planes that were under fire. Corporal Ernie Jean's plane passed the drop zone before he was able to jump. He was quoted in a 2004 edition of Canadian Military History. I was number 19 in the stick of 20 in my plane. As I made my way to the door, I heard the engine rev up and the jump master push me back. I thought to myself, we've come all this way to go back to England? But almost worse, the plane had to turn around and fly through the flak again to drop the last two paratroopers. Later, he discovered that the original 18 men had been dropped in the wrong place, and all were either captured or killed. Once dropped, the men faced more problems. Many of the pilots, trying to avoid the flak, didn't slow the planes down for a safe drop. Men lost their equipment, their carefully prepared 70-pound kit bags torn loose in the wind. Captain John Simpson was quoted in Canadian military history. The plane was going much too fast. When I went out, the prop blast tore all of my equipment off. The guy must have been going at a hell of a speed. All I had was my clothes and my 45 revolver with some ammo. Now many of the men were deprived of the heavy equipment that they needed to perform their missions. And they were at significant risk as they jumped. Many were injured, crashing into trees or buildings. Over 80 were captured almost immediately. The Germans had flooded many of the fields, knowing that there would be likely landing spots for paratroopers. That might mean being stuck in mud, but especially in the drainage ditches at the end of the fields, some six to eight feet deep, paratroops weighed down with 80 pounds of equipment could easily be drowned. The Toronto Star reported last November, the first Canadians to set foot in German-occupied France since the Dieppe raid in 1942. They came down in the dark. Many of them drowned in the swamps, flooded by the enemy. Others were shot on sight or were lost for hours before finding their marks. Once on the ground, many were nowhere near their drop zones. Lance Corporal D.S. Parley was quoted in Canadian military history. If you didn't know where the rendezvous was, they told us to face the direction of the incoming aircraft and move off to the left of their flight path. That was all well and good until I realized that every airplane that I could see was going in a different direction. The miss dropped and lost men would dramatically affect the situation on the ground. The battalion lost 15 of its 27 officers in the jump. Reader's Digest Canada told the story of Corporal John Ross. He found his kit bag, pulled out his submachine gun and radio, and then scrambled over to the group, expecting to see all 120 members of C Company. He was one of only 32 paratroopers to arrive. The others were scattered all over the countryside, some dropping as far as 16 kilometers from the rendezvous point. Almost immediately, a new disaster. Allied Lancaster bombers were scheduled to do a raid to support the nearby attack on the Merville gun battery. But missing their targets, many bombed the battalion's landing zone. Many paratroopers were killed, the rest stunned by the huge blasts. In his 1995 book, Out of the Clouds, the history of the 1st Canadian Parachute Battalion, author John Wills notes the condition of the company at the rendezvous. Over 100 men were expected to be at the rendezvous, but instead Major H.M. McLeod, commander of C Company, had only 15 the plans called for heavily armed troops with machine gun crews, heavy mortars, and Bangalore torpedoes. But the little band had only one Piat, projector infantry anti-tank gun, three Sten guns, eight rifles, and McLeod's pistol. Still, Colonel Bernd Horn wrote in his 2010 book, Men of Steel, Canadian Paratroopers in Normandy, McLeod and the remaining men proceeded to the next objective, the capture of a series of defensive positions located on the grounds of Le Grand Chateau in Veraville. McLeod wanted to use speed and the cover of darkness to assist in his attack. He knew that these two factors combined with bold, aggressive action and surprise would offset his temporary lack of manpower. While they collected men along the way, the lightly armed paratroopers were not just outnumbered, but by far more than they imagined. Wills writes, C Company had been given the task of clearing out the enemy garrison at Veraville. Given the size of the force represented by C Company, the undertaking was formidable. At the Chateau de Veraville, a 75mm anti-tank gun and fortifications, which included bunkers and trenches, had been established to control the road intersection. This was manned by a much larger force than had been anticipated. 
McLeod wanted to engage the position as quickly as possible to prevent it interfering with the imminent landing of the rest of the 6th Airborne Division. They came to the gatehouse of the chateau, finding it to be empty, but clearly having been used as a barracks. In fact, the bombing by the Lancasters had prompted the garrison to move to their trenches. As they shot down on the enemy position, they discovered for the first time the presence of the 75mm anti-tank gun. Reader's Digest Canada writes, Suddenly, gunfire sprayed the outside road, and a large shell crashed into the lower part of the building. A couple of days, paratroopers stumbled out, unhurt. The answer was now clear. The Germans had retreated to a concrete trench fortified by machine gun bays and a 75mm anti-tank gun. We had only pistols, rifles, and a two-inch mortar, said Corporal Ross. They were outgunned and outnumbered. McLeod tried to use the best weapon he had, having a corporal use their Piot, an infantry anti-tank weapon. The first shot missed the bunker, containing the 75mm gun. Before a second shot could be fired, the 75mm gun responded. The shot rocked through the wall and exploded the remaining Piot ammunition. Five of the six men in the room were killed or mortally wounded, including Major McLeod, none of whom, Reader's Digest Canada notes, had reached their 25th birthday. The Battle of Veraville was chaotic. The captain reported that complete chaos seemed to reign in the village. Against the background of Bren guns, spend down machine guns and grenades could be heard shouts in English and German. Horn quotes Battalion Deputy Commanding Officer Major Jeff Nicklin. The Germans ran around Veraville like crazy men, shot at everything that moved. Even a moving cow got a blast of machine gun fire. They were so jumpy that they ran around in twos and threes to give themselves moral support. But slowly the paratroopers identified the enemy positions, and more paratroopers straggled in, moving towards the sounds of combat. Wills writes that the breaking point was when a paratrooper corporal moved to a position where he could direct fire bombs from a two-inch mortar. He unloaded four into the enemy position. Wills writes, he quickly crawled back to the deeper ditch, expecting at any moment to be the attention of much gunfire. But none came. A few minutes later, a white flag was raised at the bunker, and Corporal Hall, the only remaining medical man at the site, accepted the surrender of the 43 German troops remaining in the defensive position. Reader's Digest Canada writes that a German sergeant asked Corporal Ross, where are the rest of your men? You have been ordered to surrender because they were up against an unbeatable force of battle-hardened Canadians. You're looking at them, Ross replied. The Toronto Star writes, In the end, a small Canadian force defeated a larger enemy contingent and took over 80 prisoners. Wrote Corporal Dan Hartigan, Two enemy soldiers for every Canadian paratrooper who fought in Veraville. The exploits of Company C of the 1st Canadian Parachute Battalion are representative of the thousands of troops that landed in France that day. Sometimes landed far from they were supposed to be, often cut off from command, they formed together in small groups, and they figured out ways to meet their objectives. Notably, the 1st Canadian Parachute Battalion met all of their D-Day objectives on the first day. Very few units could say the same. But it came at a terrible cost. In the first 24 hours of the invasion, the battalion lost 116 casualties. And before the Battle of Normandy was over, they would lose 24 officers and 343 men. The Toronto Star concludes, That invasion was the beginning of the end for Nazi Germany. What those Canadians did that day and over the next 14 months is the stuff of legends. I hope you enjoyed this episode of The History Guy. Check out our community on thehistoryguyguild.locals.com, our webpage at thehistoryguy.com, and our merchandise at teespring.com, or book a special message from The History Guy on Cameo. And if you'd like more episodes on Forgotten History, all you have to do is subscribe.